Thank you uh, for joining us this morning. Uh, got some great content for you on a very important topic. Should be a topic that's top of mind for all businesses, but particularly um, with the SMB or small and medium-sized business market today. Let's um, go ahead and get started with some introductions. I'm Dave Buggy, uh, Vice President and Partner here at Behringer, and I've got Nick Hahn. Uh, Nick's been with us a, a long, long time. Uh, Nick is, uh, is an expert around lots of things uh, in IT, particularly around network security, around uh, Microsoft's Office 365 platform, um, and just IT infrastructure overall. So welcome, Nick, and uh, thanks for joining us today. Good morning, everyone. All right, um, so we're going to get started here with a little bit of background information and uh, kind of tee up uh, what we're, uh, we're going to talk about today around cybersecurity. But first, just a, a few housekeeping notes. Uh, we are using GoToWebinar, obviously, today. Uh, all attendees are in listen-only mode. We definitely encourage feedback and certainly questions. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, there is a question uh, area within your uh, GoToWebinar client. Simply type that in. We'll be uh, taking a look at that throughout the presentation and also leaving time at the end for questions. Uh, so please give us your feedback, answer, uh, ask any questions that uh, you would like to, and uh, make it an interactive session. If you'd like to get a little bit more screen real estate, uh, you also have a button here in the GoToMeeting client that you can toggle into full screen mode. makes the presentation a little bit bigger and easier to read. Um, so you can use that. Uh, if you have any, any problems with audio or video, uh, go ahead and either ask a question or hit the raise your hand button. Again, we'll be looking at that throughout the presentation. Um, so uh, with that, let's uh, go ahead and get started. So the reality is that in a connected world, there is risk uh, no matter what. So if you have your systems connected uh, to any external source, and really even internal threats as well, you don't even really need to be connected externally, um, there's certainly a lot of, of threats that happen internally at a company through theft and, and you know, other things. But focusing kind of today on just cybersecurity in general, that whenever you have a system that's connected uh, to the internet or a network of any kind that's out of your control, the reality is that you definitely have risk there. Um, so. Um, a few things here that I thought were really uh, interesting and important as we kind of get started is that 75% uh, of the uh, intrusions that happen on networks today are a result of exploited credentials. So that just simply means somebody is able to figure out or steal your user ID and password and be able to log in to a system or a network uh, for malicious purposes, let's say. Um, also about 80% um, are, is the statistic around employees that are accessing non-approved software um, or internet websites uh, throughout the course of their day and from a company-owned equipment or a company-owned network. So definitely some risk there that we'll talk about. And that when there is a breach in your system, uh, that it's about 140 days on average before that breach is detected and then measures are taken to you know, close down that breach and, and uh, you know, lock um, that or block that hole in your systems or your network. So you know, think about the amount of things that could be happening within that 140 days. Um, so it, going back to the first point there, you can really easily handle, or, or not maybe completely handle, but at least lower your risk pretty significantly just by putting in a password policy. Um, so basically, um, that you're able to control then users, their passwords, how often they have to change their password, and probably most importantly is around the complexity requirements. Um, so you can force a user to have to include numbers and characters and symbols and it has to be a certain length. Um, they can't reuse a password. It can't be just a, you know, a, a standard word. Um, you know, lots of levels that you can take that to, but um, the bottom line is that you're, you're much better able to control the user's passwords, the uh, frequency of change, and reduce that particular risk. Um, that probably is something that, that you all have today. Um, if you are on a Windows server-based network, uh, you definitely have that capability, something that uh, we'd be happy to, to talk further about if you'd like. But simple, um, you know, almost no-cost type of mechanism that you can employ to, uh, to greatly in increase your, um, your protection. 
Also, you can utilize firewalls or even web content filtering software to restrict users out of uh, applications and sites that you may not want them uh, to utilize from company-owned equipment or from uh, your company-owned network. So you think about some sites that you would not want users to go to in any situation. Probably you wouldn't want them looking on a, on a job search site, right? So that's something that's kind of a no-brainer uh, to block them out of. Um, you know, some of the social media sites, maybe or maybe not, uh, blocking people out of those depending on your business model. And if you utilize those tools during the course of business, then you may want, you know, to let them access those. Um, but other sites that may contain malicious content as well, um, you, you know, want to block them out of. So you can, you can employ um, capabilities on your firewall or even in, uh, put in place a web content filtering product to uh, restrict users out of certain sites and applications. So let's go forward. So I wanted to talk a minute about some high-profile security breaches that have happened. Um, this happens to be in the supply chain. There's a lot of industry analysts out there that are really looking at supply chain um, going forward as one of the key target areas for uh, cyber breaches overall. Um, and these are just ones that received a lot of attention. We're going to talk about some others as we go forward. But in 2013, I'm sure that probably everybody's at least heard about the target breach that happened. Um, basically, it was theft of about 110 million customers' data. Uh, there were about 40 million credit and debit card um, information that was, that was taken. And what's interesting is that this breach occurred through a connection established by a very small company, um, and it was a vendor to Target called Fazio Mechanical Services. And uh, it, it's a common way that, that people are inf infiltrating systems is that you, know, you may have a trusted connection with a, a vendor or a customer. Well, if somebody infiltrates their system and they have access to your systems, then you know, they're one hop away from being able to uh, come into your systems or your network um, and potentially do damage there as well. So that all started that huge um, theft of information from Target, a uh, huge company, started with a connection to a very small vendor that they utilized uh, in Fazio Mechanical Services. Home Depot in 2014, uh, similar type of uh, scenario where there was 56 million payment cards uh, that were breached. Um, a lot of email addresses were taken. Um, and you look at something like email and you say, well, yeah, okay, what, what does that mean? Somebody going to get more spam as a result of that? Well, there's a broader impact to all this. I mean, think about those two pieces of information. If they had your payment card, your credit card, card information, and your email address, what could they do with that? Well, a lot of times your email address is used as a, as a mechanism for authentication um, for sites that you utilize, your bank, your credit card. Um, you know, that could be a first step that's used in trying to, um, you know, to uh, do fraudulent activity on a, on a bank account or a card, right? So some little piece of information, while it looks kind of innocuous at, at maybe the surface, can really be pretty important. And you start putting some pieces of information together, and you can really start to see that there is potential for, for some damage. Anyway. Um, in this particular instance with Home Depot, the hackers used a third-party vendor's uh, user ID and password to gain access into the systems. And what they were able to do once they were in the system is to install malware on self-checkout systems. So those uh, great systems that uh, I know I use to self-check out so I don't have to wait in line, um, they were able to put malware on those. So as people were putting in their payment card information, putting in their PIN number and so forth, uh, that data was being, was being stolen off those, um, off those systems. And then in uh, 2016, a company you, you may not have heard of, uh, the company is called uh, FACC. And uh, basically, that company is a large supplier of aircraft uh, parts and so forth to large companies like Boeing um, and Airbus, right? So um, what happened there was there was $47 million that was stolen from that organization. And it was through what's called a fake president scam. Um, and a fake president scam is um, one where they, they infiltrate your email and they send an, an email that looks like it's internal to someone like your controller um, in your organization. And they say, hey, I'm, I'm doing an acquisition or I need to you know, fund some type of venture. I need you to transfer this amount of money into this wired uh, account, right? So if it looks like it's a valid email and that's kind of a common course of action company, that transaction might just happen. Well, 
This is an example where that uh, did exactly that. So the email was sent uh, masquerading as the president. Um, Walter Steffen asked for money to be transferred to an account that the hackers controlled. And uh, as a result, they lost uh, uh, quite a bit of money through that direct transfer. It wasn't the full $47 million. Um, I understand that that couldn't all be transferred at once. So it was done in batches, and they were able to catch that. Um, and, and the full $47 million was not taken. Nobody knows. It's never been released what amount was. But I can tell you that that company lost over $25 million uh, as a result, largely as a result of you know, the media around um, that infiltration. And that happened over 2015-2016. Uh, and interestingly enough, that if you compare that to the prior year before this particular breach happened, uh, they lost about $4 million. So definitely a kind of a direct uh, correlation there to uh, this breach and uh, them losing money uh, overall as a result of that um, over the next uh, two years. So. Um, by all accounts, if you go out, and I did this as part of uh, preparing for this session, if you just go into a search engine and type in cyber, um, you know, cyber security attack or cyber attack small business, you'll get an entire page of some of the biggest names in media and uh, research telling you that attacks on small businesses have been on the rise and will continue to be on the rise in, in a pretty big way. Um, so a couple that I took out of some, some very credible sources was that 43% of the attacks worldwide are happening now against small businesses, and, and that's those with less than 250 workers. And why is that? Well, small businesses are considered soft targets. So you go back to those breaches that happened at uh, Target and Home Depot. So if, if those people tried to get directly into Target systems, um, would they have been successful? Maybe, but likely not, right? Because Target uh, has spent a lot of money, uh, probably, let, let's hope, on their uh, security in general, right? So what did they do? Well, they found a small company whose um, capabilities around uh, protections in that were certainly not nearly as good as uh, Target. Who knows if they were, they were even really going after Target, right? They could have just um, been able to infiltrate this small business's systems and saw that there was... Um, you know, a, a connection, let's say, to Target, and was then able to utilize that, and ended up with you know the breach that uh, that's been widely publicized. So, all in all, uh, small businesses are being targeted because uh, the capabilities of larger organizations, the technology has certainly uh, increased in capabilities. So they're kind of coming down market and looking for organizations that uh, don't have as great of capabilities around protection. Uh, another great, uh, not great statistic, but uh, certainly eye-opening is that uh, the FBI says that in 2015, there were about 7,000 small businesses that reported um, losses of about $740 million. And I emphasize the word reported. Um, a lot of times, these things go unreported, right? Because businesses really don't want the, um, the negative publicity that, that could happen in reporting a breach, right? Small businesses don't want that either. Uh, it's not just a big business mindset. Um, but then you look at the next statistic. In, in 2016, over just a two-month period, one in five small businesses reported that they had some form of cyber attack. One in five. Again, keyword there being reported. Um, so the, the real number there is much greater than one in five. I don't know what that is, but I can tell you that it's much greater because a lot of these things just aren't reported, or maybe they're caught before there was significant damage that was done, so it wasn't you know as, as big of a, an ordeal, let's say, as if it continued, things like that, that you know really keep that that number low. And then just about everybody um, in the market that uh, that's about security, cybersecurity, hacking, they all say that um, small businesses are increasingly being targeted. Um, there's some really interesting information now too that, that if you're in uh, the manufacturing sector. Um, particularly in, in critical manufacturing. So those are companies that are producing, um, you know, critical items for our infrastructure, right? So, um, you know, natural and oil, things like that. Those are, are hugely being targeted, and there's a lot of small businesses that work in and around those industries as well, right? So you could be just supplying that industry, and you could be considered kind of a, um, you know, a key target um, for uh, cyber theft today.
we can advance our slide there. All right. So at this point, I want to turn it over to Nick. So hopefully, I've sufficiently, um, you know, uh, uh, scared everybody and and uh, kind of everybody uh, looking at the threat now, um, particularly as it relates to small businesses. And and I have to say, in dealing with with small sized businesses for 25 plus years, it's always been an area that hasn't been exceptionally top of mind uh, for those businesses. They kind of felt like, gee, what do I have to steal? Well. Honestly, you have a lot to steal, um, and, and you know some of the things that people and the reasons that organizations are being targeted. Um, it's, you know, you look at some of the things that can happen. What they're doing with this information is they're they're doing, as I said, fraudulent wire transfers. Um, there is a lot of fraud right now around tax returns, so they're trying to get information that would enable them to file fraudulent tax returns and get refunds. They're trying to commit health insurance or Medicaid fraud. I mean, think about that. Just about any employee that has HR type of information um, accessible, you know, that could be a target for that type of fraud. Um, and also then the theft of intellectual property is another key target area today um, that we're seeing uh, on the rise. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Nick Hahn. Uh, Nick uh, is going to take us through some, uh, some great uh, solutions that we have to offer around keeping you secure. So Nick, take it away. Great. Thank you, Dave. And um, so now that Dave has sufficiently scared everyone, um, I'm here to talk about what we can do about uh, some of these threats. So as I'm sure everyone's aware, your data nowadays is everywhere, right? It's in the cloud, it's on your laptops, it's your desktops, it's on your mobile devices, your tablets, um, so forth. And all that data is susceptible to, to threats, whether it be viruses, hacks, um, stolen or lost devices, or good old-fashioned user error. So, you know, with, with data everywhere, how do, we, how do we protect it all, right? Is, is there any way we can, we can keep this all secure? And the simple answer is there is no magic bullet to staying secure. There's no one solution that's going to accomplish that all. So you really need to look at a, a holistic approach. You know, you think about it, hey, I got antivirus. Well, that's great. That solves a very small piece of the puzzle. Um, so you need to look at you know the other pieces of the puzzle that you know maybe aren't as, as apparent as just viruses things like again hacks or credential stealing or again user error lost devices things like that um, you really need a, a solution and a suite of solutions that's going to to look at those threats in a very smart intelligent way and act on them and stay up to date with the changing landscape of security um, cybersecurity. And at the end of the day, you need to continue to stay vigilant. Um, with things changing every day, um, you're going to have you know, new threats, people trying to um, work around the systems that are put in place. Um, hacking is not going to go away anytime soon. So you definitely need to keep current with the trends. And, and honestly, you know, chances are your day job isn't to be an IT security professional. So partnering with experts that uh, can keep you informed and, and keep you up to date with uh, what solutions are uh, the best in market today. So with that, um, one solution uh, that we do offer and it helps solve several pieces of this puzzle, um, and that is Microsoft's Enterprise Mobility and Security Suite, um, or EMS as they call it. So EMS is, is a suite of services. Um, it's an innovative suite um, that provide, it's provided by Microsoft. It's a hosted service, um, so uh, very little um, that needs to be done uh, in terms of infrastructure. Um, you don't need to bring in tons of servers and things like that where you know, security was very complicated before and you have to you know, put out a lot of upfront costs. Definitely not the case here. Um, it has a much more holistic approach to identity-driven security. So those threats that um, come in place of your passwords being stolen or your systems being hacked, um, this really helps round out all the different threats from that perspective. Um, and there's a couple key components to it, and we'll get into what each of those does. Um, advanced threat analytics, uh, rights management, mobile device management, and uh, multi-factor authentication. The good thing about the solution, again, it's a it's, it's very holistic approach. It helps protect your users by securing your authentication and reporting on those threats so that you can act on them uh, before it's too late. Um, does intelligent analysis of user behavior, so it learns you know, what normal user access is versus abnormal user access. And it also helps protect your data and applications with rules, policies, and flexible administrative controls. 
So the first piece of the suite, uh, advanced threat analytics, um, I like to think of it as kind of the watchdog for your network. So it's, it's a piece of software that sits out there and it analyzes um, all your user accounts and the network behaviors and things like that. It looks for um, known attacks, things like port scans, uh, brute force attacks where people are just randomly trying to hack into accounts with random passwords. Um, but more importantly, it, it actually has a, a whole behavior analysis um, component to it. So very similar to how I'm sure you've seen credit card companies work nowadays, where you might get a call from your credit card company that says, hey, you know, we noticed that you just made a, a, a transaction at an electronic store in California for $500 today. And well, hey, hold on, I'm in New Jersey. Uh, that's not me. And how do they know that? Um, they know that through uh, what's called machine learning. Um, and that is what advanced threat analytics does. It looks at accounts and it says, okay, well, Nick logged in in South Jersey at 9 a.m. this morning, and then he logged in at 10 a.m. in uh, the Czech Republic. Well, chances are that's probably not really Nick. So the alarm bells go up, and it allows you to act on that before it's too late. The next uh, next piece of the suite here uh, is their multi-factor authentication. So. Um, again, something you might have seen uh, certain websites use where they need, you need a, sec a separate step to get into your account, right? Maybe your bank does this, maybe your credit card company. Um, so multi-factor authentication is something you know, right, which is your username and password, and something you have, which is usually a trusted device like a cell phone or a tablet or something that is unique to you. Um, and what it does is when you, you know, it's very easy to, to, to set up for the users. It's as simple as installing an app on your smartphone. And if you don't have a smartphone, um, it can do things like give you a phone call on your, on your phone number or shoot you a text message and you need to reply to that to, to grant you access into that. So it's, you know, the days of, you know, the users with the passwords of one, two, three, four, five. And believe me, there's still users out there that still use passwords like that. Um, this really helps add that extra layer of protection where, it, hey, someone can't just guess my password or if they find out from some way, they would need my password and my phone to be able to get in. Um, and if that's the case, you probably know about it beforehand. So, um, Speaking of mobile devices, um, mobile device management is another piece of this suite. Um, so nowadays it's it's very difficult for IT and businesses to kind of maintain their data because people are bringing in their own personal devices and they're accessing work resources with it whether it be your smartphone that you're accessing email with or a tablet that you're opening you know Dropbox files and moving company files into a personal Dropbox um, you know it's not going away anytime soon um, so the whole bring your own device problem, um, you know, comes into play and, and it's very hard, for, again, for IT to control that. So what's the answer to that? Um, mobile device management um, can help you uh, maintain those devices, whether they're company-owned devices or personal devices. And it does it in, in a pretty smart way. So, again, very simple. It's an application that gets installed via, you know, the, the Windows App Store, the uh, iOS App Store, or the Android App Store. Um, very easy, just uses a typical username and password that you use on your network. And once it's installed, it gives um, IT the, the uh, ability to set up um, different policies. So we can set up things like conditional access. We're going to talk about what that is a little bit in a second. Um, enforcement of compliance. So I can say, hey, anybody who will be on my network and wants to attach to my company uh, data needs to have a pin on their device. It, maybe it needs to be encrypted. Um, maybe I want to push out certain applications to it where, you know, hey, I want to push out the email configuration or a VPN configuration. Um, you can do that all through this, make it automatic, um, actually helps deploy um, mobile devices very easily, um, but also helps you control those. And in the case where somebody goes and they lose that device or it gets stolen, um, we can choose to either wipe the entire device or selectively wipe that device. So uh, again, very, very good for the bring your own device um, uh, conundrum where, hey, I don't want to wipe, if, if an employee leaves, I want to wipe out all their email access, I want to wipe out all their file access for anything corporate, but I don't want to touch their personal pictures. Well, we have the ability to do that with the mobile device management. We can selectively wipe that device, or again, if the device is stolen, we can wipe the entire device, lock it so it can't be used. 
Um, as I mentioned before, conditional access, this is pretty neat. So with that mobile device management um, policies, what we can do is we can choose to uh, allow or block access to company resources based on those policies that we set up. So again, as I mentioned, if your phone doesn't have a PIN, for example, don't let them access email. If it's um, an I iOS device and it's before a certain version because there's some security vulnerability, don't let them access it. If it's a rooted device, don't let them access it. Um, and again, we can push those policies out and block things uh, based upon that. We can even go as far as to block based on location or IP address. So if they're outside of the country, I don't want them accessing our, our uh, resources. We have the ability to do that. And for corporate-owned devices, you can even go as far as to block access to certain applications. I don't want them to install Facebook on there. I don't want them to be able to use the camera or use the SD card. Um, so it would give you that ability to do that as well. And we talked a little bit about this. So um, it, it, it does a good job of kind of maintaining a personal experience and a business experience um, on those devices. So again, if you're any application that's pushed out as part of this, we have full control over. We can lock it down, we can wipe it, we can do whatever we want. Anything that was installed prior to that or after that that wasn't part of the company policy, completely separate, we can choose to not do anything with those um, if that's what the uh, if that's what the, uh, you know, the desired effect is, if you will. Um, but we can even go further than that, and we can say that anything that was pushed through a company policy, like email, or maybe it's uh, OneDrive where you have file storage, we can block their ability to copy, paste, save files from the business applications to the personal applications. So if someone goes into an email and wants to copy the contents of it and move it to a personal notebook, um, won't allow you to do it. Um, we can block that ability. Um, but then if they want to copy it and move it to a Word document that's stored on a company OneDrive, for example, a document storage repository, we can allow that. So it gives you a lot of control on where your data is going um, so that your data isn't necessarily moving out of the business applications into the personal applications. So <clears throat> The next piece of this puzzle um, is what's called rights management. And rights management um, helps you control data um, outside of just the mobile space. So you know, we talked about what we can do with mobile device management. Well, with rights management, it goes a step further. So whether it be emails or documents, um, it's, it gives us the ability, it's a tool that we can set up policies against. And we can do a lot of those same things that we just talked about with mobile device management, where we can block the ability to copy or paste from a document. So maybe I'm sending a financial statement to our accountant. And once it leaves my inbox, right, traditionally I have no control over what happens to it, right? So it's an Excel spreadsheet maybe. Um, once the accountant gets it, he can do whatever he wants with it. He can edit it, he can forward it to his friends, he can publish it online for all he, he cares. Um, what rights management gives us the ability to do is control that. So we can protect a document or an email and set rules on it. So I can set it so that the person I send it to is the only person that can read it. And they're not allowed to forward it to anybody. And they're not allowed to edit it. And they can't copy or paste from it. And they can't print from it. It also gives us the ability to set an expiration on those um, items. So maybe I want them to have access to that Excel document, but only for a week. And then after a week, it times out, they can no longer access it. Um, maybe I want to, maybe it's a document I sent and I didn't put a time frame on it, but hey, now I don't want them to have access to it. I have control to go into a portal and kill the access to that document right then and there so that uh, that, that user or person, whether it's inside or outside of your organization, um, would not have access to that document. And throughout this whole process, um, that portal gives you the ability to track what's happening with that. So it will tell you if that user opened that document. If you allowed them to edit it, did they edit it? If you allowed them to forward it, did they forward it? Um, so a total control over your, your, your document email management from that perspective. Um, as well as for compliance reasons, um, it has an encryption uh, component built into it for email. So um, you can set up policies to either automatically encrypt email based on maybe it's some regulation. There's built-in templates for HIPAA and uh, you know, the SEC and, and all major compliance regulations. Um, or maybe you'd want to set your own policy where, you know, if I type the word encrypt in the subject line, that message goes out and is forced to be encrypted. 
um, gives you full flexibility to do um, things like that. And we talked a little bit about this already, so with that rights management, how that works, um, you send that document or email out to somebody. Um, they're going to get it as an attachment or as an email if it's just an email. And to open that up, they're going to have to go to a portal. And they're going to have a username login that they set up. And once they get into that, they can access that document. Um, and you have the ability to share those documents, track and revoke them, and um, set it even so that if there is no internet connection, they can't access that document. Because if there's no internet connection, you can't do things like do that, um, revoke the access to it, right? So it's all handled through internet communication. So we can set that up as well. <clears throat> So throughout all this, you know, we're, we're talked about a few different uh, products here. They're all added together into one suite of products, which is great because there's no one else on the market that's offering all of these things in one solution. Um, you can find mobile device management. You can find encryption softwares. You're going to go to four, to four or five different vendors. It's going to cost you probably ten times what uh, this product it would, would um, cost you. So um, very, very flexible, um, very, very um, good that it, it is incorporated into one solution. Um, and what's great is that it lets you utilize what you already have. So whether you have Android devices, iOS, Apple devices, Windows devices, whether it's a smartphone, a tablet, or a PC, works across the board. So it's taking your, your IT investments that you already have or even your BYOD policy that you already have, and it's going to work with that. So very, very little upfront cost to get into a solution like this. And it's, it's a hosted, hosted service, so subscription-based. So you're always up to date, right? So you don't have to worry about updating a server every, you know, every six months when an update comes out. You don't have to worry about buying a new server when it's out of date and, and, and uh, needs to be refreshed. Um, so it keeps up with, with updates and with new devices. So when the next version of the iPhone comes out and it's iOS 11, um, this will be ready for that. Um, when it's the next version of Windows that comes out, it will be ready for that. Um, constantly up to date, and it's something, as, since it's a subscription base, you don't need to keep up with yourself. It's being kept up for you. Um, as we mentioned, it works with what you have. So whether it's you know a smartphone, a tablet, a PC, whether it's Apple, Windows, Linux, works with all those. Um, and it's pretty easy to set up, especially for the end user. So again, it, whether it be the mobile device management component or the, um, the uh, rights management component, um, whether it's the encryption, all this stuff is either happening in the background or it's a little app that they install on their smartphone. Very, very simple. So just to kind of recap this solution and what's included in that, um, we have Microsoft's Advanced Threat Analytics. So that is our solution, again, as I said, the watchdog for the network, keeping an eye on things, raising the alarm bells when something goes wrong. Um, Microsoft Intune, which is the mobile device management component, so allowing you to secure those mobile devices. Azure Rights Management, which allows you to uh, control and secure your documents and emails. And then the multi-factor authentication, which adds that extra layer of security for your, uh, your username, password, and the systems that you need to access. So with that, um, again, as I said, this solves many pieces of the puzzle. We didn't talk about antivirus. I'm pretty sure probably everybody has antivirus. If you don't, you know, get it. Um, firewalls, things like that. Again, other pieces of the puzzle. Um, but as we all know, IT security is a cat and mouse game. So there's a big business in hacking. There's big business in malware, in ransomware. And the bad guys are always going to try to stay a step ahead. They're always going to try to find ways around. And honestly, the only way to be 100% protected is to unplug your computer from the wall. And I don't think we can work that way. So what do we do when all else fails? We need to have a good business continuity solution. And we'll talk about what that means. It's not just backup. Um, so looking at some of the risks, even outside of IT security, 25% uh, of production machines will have a failure this year. doesn't matter if it's six months old or six weeks old. A server can fail. A desktop can fail. Um, you could get hacked. Um, you could get a virus that could wipe out your data. 24% um, of companies have had a full data disaster, meaning that they've lost data and were not able to recover it. And 70% of small businesses that experience one of those major data losses are out of business within a year. 
So, you know, let's talk about some of those risks. Obviously, like we said, there's hardware failure. Okay, there's malware. There's hacks. Um, I'm sure you've all seen or heard of ransomware. So this guy right here, Crypto Locker or Crypto Wall, um, this has been out for a couple years now, and there's been many variations of it. And it's a good example of how um, the how these virus creators kind of work around the system. Um, came out a couple years ago, and it's still running and still infecting people because they keep changing the method that it's deployed. They keep changing the method that it's discovered, and it's getting around a lot of antiviruses or a lot of spam filters and, and so forth. So what this, this particular piece of ransomware does is it typically comes in through an email or a website. You open a link um, to what you feel is you know, something that's not uh, a risk. Um, they do a good job of masquerading that. Um, and once it's, in, once it's set up on your system, it goes out and it encrypts any data that you have access to, whether it be on your computer or on your servers on your network that you have access to. So any of those map drives you have, any of those server shares that you have, it's going to go out and encrypt those. So not just affecting that particular user, but affecting that user and any data that user has access to. And what they'll do is they'll give you between 24 and 72 hours typically to pay a ransom to get the encryption key to unlock your data. And that can be anywhere from $400 to $5,000. Um, once that time limit is expired, they destroy the encryption keys and you're never getting that data back. So you know, you have a couple options here. Do you pay it and hope that the, the virus creator that put the, the virus on your system is honorable enough to give you the encryption key? And sometimes they are. Um, but what you don't know is what else is on your system. What else could have happened to that data? Is this going to happen again in six months from now? So um, I don't know if you're like me. I don't like to give money to people that hold my, my data ransom. So that's where you want to look at a uh, business continuity solution. Um, so backup's great. You know, backup is definitely your entry level step. Everyone should have some form of backup in place. But backup is not business continuity. So your typical backup system um, is going to give you local protection, right? So it's it's writing to hopefully not tape anymore, but an external hard drive potentially. Um, hopefully you take it off site, um, and it, it it writes it takes the data from your servers and writes that to that external hard drive or that you know NAS or whatnot. Um, typically doesn't have cloud protection. Can have some type of cloud protection, but typically doesn't. Um, is it able to restore your operating system files and applications? Typically not, um, depends on the solution. So it, it really depends on if you have what's called an image-based backup solution. Um, what that means is that you have a server, and that server takes a snapshot of the entire system on a schedule um, versus file-level backup that just backs up the data selectively. So when you have a file-level um, backup, what happens is if the whole system fails, you need to get a new server, you need to install the operating system, you need to install the applications, reconfigure all the settings, then restore all your data. And as you can imagine, that takes quite a long time. Um, can take days, weeks for that to, to be accomplished. Um, an image level solution is a step above that. It does allow you to restore it, the entire system in one step. Um, but what it doesn't accomplish for you by itself is it doesn't give you any type of continuity for the system. So again, if there's a hardware failure on the server, and you can't get it replaced for two days or even a week, that image level backup isn't doing anything for you in the meantime. So it doesn't help you prevent downtime. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, your recovery time is looking at hours to weeks, depending on how much data you have, whether you have a warranty on your system, whether or not you have other uh, places to put it, whether or not it's file or image level. A business continuity solution is going to help you accomplish all those things, right? So it's going to back up your files locally. It's going to synchronize them to the cloud. It's going to be image level, so it's going to let you restore everything in one step. And it's going to give you what's called um, instant local and cloud recovery. So if my server dies and I realize I can't get that up and running quickly, do I have the ability to take one of those images of that server and create a virtual copy of my server that I can now access and give my users access to and run and now I can fix the hardware in my, you know, in a more convenient time, and we can pick a time on the weekend after hours to restore back to that physical hardware. Uh, a good business continuity solution is going to do that for you, which is going to help you prevent downtime 
and limit your recovery time from hours to weeks to seconds or minutes. Um, so we also have a, a solution that does this. Um, as I mentioned, does image level backups, copies that entire system multiple times a day. We can do it as, as often as every 15 minutes. Typically, it's every hour. But every 15 minutes, we can take a snapshot of that system so that if the system dies, you're not going back to the previous night or maybe the previous week or whenever that backup system last ran, you're going back to a very, very short time window before. Um, gives you that near, virt near instant virtualization. So again, that server dies, that system dies, we need to be up and running within minutes. Flick of the switch and you can have a virtual copy of that server up and running, has the exact same copy of everything that was on there and your users have access to it. Um, and it goes a step above that as well. If there is a site-wide disaster, right, so the server room floods, right, the server gets destroyed and the backup system gets destroyed, what do we do? Well, we have the ability to virtualize those systems in the cloud and give you remote access to them so that you can keep running while you uh, work on contingencies to get your, your uh, local systems back up and running. Um, and another nice feature of this too um, is what's called screenshot verification. So most backup systems have some type of um, some type of way of telling you that the backup was successful or not. It's usually, you know, an email or an alert that says backup was successful. Okay, that's great. Um, how do we test that? Do we go in and we restore one file? Okay, we restored one file. What about the other 10 million files that are on the system? Um, what this does, and it does it automated, is that it actually spins up a virtual copy of that system every single day. It takes a picture of it so that you know that that system can be spun up, virtualized, and is accessible, and it emails it out to you. So it takes the headache away of testing backups. It takes the headache away of whether or not your, your data is not only successfully backed up, but also restorable. Um, so again, encompasses that whole thing. So um, hopefully, uh, hopefully I kind of gave you an idea there of, of a couple different methods, a couple different solutions to protect yourself proactively. And then also, again, when, whenever, when all else fails and something goes wrong, whether it be from a cyber attack or from you know, an act of God, um, we have a system to get you back up and running. And with that, I'm going to kick it back over to Dave. Um, Dave, I'd see if we have any uh, questions out there. Yeah, Nick, somebody had asked, uh, related to the different areas of uh, coverage for the platform that you talked about, can, can those be licensed individually, meaning if you just need, let's say, mobile device management? That's a great, great question. So going back to the different solutions, let me step back here. I'll sh go back to my slide with uh, the solutions here. So these different components of the suite, um, they can be licensed individually, all of them. Um, but there is a tremendous value to going with the bundle. So some of these, if you were to add up all these things, say you needed, if you only needed one piece of this, yes, you can do that. If you need two pieces of this, it makes more financial sense to go with the bundle. It's going to cost you less. Um, so the way that this is packaged and, and is, is so attractive pricing-wise, um, if you go a la carte, again, any more than one of these, get the bundle, even if you don't use all of it. You might use it down the line. You might roll it out later. Um, makes sense to do the bundle, but it is available a la carte as well. Great. And you brought up uh, two-factor authentication. Um, it's something that I talk a lot about with my clients in that uh, from a personal perspective, not, not only necessarily just from a business perspective, but turn on multi-factor authentication wherever possible. And one of those areas is uh, Google's Gmail. Um, they have uh, multi-factor authentication. Definitely turn that on uh, if you uh, utilize Gmail. Um, other email systems, check with the provider to see if they offer uh, multi-factor authentication and certainly around your financial accounts like your bank accounts and so forth. Definitely check in and see if there is multi-factor authentication offered. It's, it's a great level of protection um, and, and it's very simple, right? And it typically won't cost you anything to do that. So definitely a, a big recommendation around that. So, so we wrap up. If there are any other questions, feel free to enter those in the question pane. Uh, What's the next steps? You've learned some things today. There's definitely an increased level of risk, particularly around small businesses, on the rise, uh, cyber attacks in small businesses. Well, definitely uh, one thing you could take action on now is to evaluate your level of risk. Um, I you know, interact with a lot of business owners that feel like, geez, we've got a firewall, we've got some, some antivirus, we've got an IT department, uh, we should be covered. Well, 
you know, should uh, is probably the, the key term there. You really don't know, right? Because you're busy running your company. Um, you're not into the bits and bytes of, of the level of protection that your uh, IT infrastructure currently has. Definitely a recommendation to bring in an outside expert um, to be able to evaluate your level of risk. Uh, some of the things that we look at when we're brought into a client is to look at your backup disaster recoverability and continuity uh, to see if you're, if you're protected in case there is an incident. Um, you know, it, we walk into businesses and find lots and lots and lots of things. We find that, you know, some of the most critical data isn't even being backed up. Um, or the backup methodology is just not uh, working, right? So when's the last time you actually put to test your backup methodology? You don't want to do that when you have a critical event happen. You want to do that ahead of that and make sure that you, you know, you have the ability to restore and, and to continue business through some type of outage. Uh, everything from virus protection to full scans of your network to determine, um, you know, if there are security uh, concerns across your network. If you're a business that has compliance issues, so if you take credit cards, um, if you're a public company and, and have uh, the compliance there, if you're a health healthcare-based organization, you have compliance there around HIPAA, uh, we definitely look at those areas as well. So uh, definitely consider bringing somebody in to take a look at that if you don't have those deeper levels of resources internally. We can absolutely help with that. Uh, feel free to reach out to us at any point in time if you'd like to discuss that. Um, if you have any other questions that you think of after the session, by all means, reach out. Uh, I want to thank Nick Hahn for the great content today, and I want to thank everybody for joining us. If there's no other questions, we'll, uh, we'll give you a couple minutes back today. So I appreciate everybody joining, and uh, have a fantastic day.